But we're going to the Winter Olympics and to uh, Pyeongchang, where uh, we're joined by Bubba Newby. Bubba, how are you doing? So good. How are you guys? Yeah, pretty good. Um, you've uh, become something of a cult hero in Ireland. Are you aware of this yet? <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't really know. I saw. I just saw the front page paper, though. That's. Just, I like that picture. I'm hyped. That was the one that made the paper. <laughs> How long did you live in Cork? Uh, two years, I think. And so the rest, the rest of your uh, time growing up would have been in Utah, is that right? Yeah, went from Cork straight to Utah and then in the same spot that I grew up. And tell me, at what point did you realize that it was a possibility that you could represent Ireland and that it was a real thing that you could actually qualify and be in the Olympics under the Irish flag? Um, well, it's a different thing for me in freestyle skiing because it wasn't an option. Like, it hasn't been an Olympic event until 2014. And so I never really knew. But then I saw, when I realized I could do it, I saw Seamus O'Connor, the snowboarder, saw him compete in 2014 in the Sochi Olympics. And I was like, oh, man, if he can do it, so can I. Uh, Bubba, you, you obviously, you mentioned there uh, living in Utah, and I presume you look back to 2002, Salt Lake City being the host uh, city to the Winter Games, that must have had a huge impact on you, and you must have looked at the, the Olympic rings and said, I want to compete in that one day. Oh, definitely. Uh, my dad took me to a few events. I was really young at the time, but he took me to a few events, and the Olympic spirit in Utah is alive and well still. All the venues are still used as training for, or like training venues for athletes currently. So it's uh, it's great, and Utah is crazy. You can throw a snowball with your eyes closed with your left hand and hit an Olympian. So they're everywhere, and it just makes you see that it's a real tangible thing. I had no idea that um, obviously Utah is such a, an amazing hotbed of winter sports like when you're growing up are you skiing and skating and snowboarding is that just kind of how life is all the time yeah pretty much like that's just a skiing mecca really everyone skis really i mean not everyone but you know a lot of people ski in utah it's uh just what you do like that's what i grew up doing i never remember not skiing is there something about the half pipe that might uh appeal to a creative gene in you because I like correct me if I'm wrong here but just watching the Olympics over the last week and a half or so and you look at the likes of Mogul and Ariel and it feels like there's a textbook uh, winning jump in all these sports that if you master that you're going to win whereas in the half pipe there's an element of creativity there that you can kind of be wide-eyed after watching the event and thinking that was amazing I've never seen that before and ultimately creativity is awarded in the sport would that be fair to say? Yeah you it, that's exactly right. And um, aerials and moguls, the jumps actually have a degree of difficulty. So you have a certain score you can get maximum if you do that and you're trying to do the trick exactly how they would say in the textbook, pretty much. In my sport, you can do whatever you want. It's free. It's truly as freestyle. You can do whatever you want. Like, you don't have to tell the judges what you're going to do. You don't have to tell anyone what you're going to do. If you mess up on one trick, you can adjust your run halfway through like you can do whatever you want and it really I love being creative and I love doing tricks that uh, don't really make sense physics wise you know I have a one trick that I'll spin I'll go upside down spinning left but then halfway through I'll start spinning right and uh, you can just do whatever you want and it really apply it really speaks to me that way so, so what are you thinking when you're about to start your run, your second run yesterday, the one you ultimately fall in, but you have to try and put it off because you're two points outside of the qualification places. Is it a jump that you've executed before or is it something completely outlandish that you just need to go for? Uh, well, I mean, the trick I fell on was a trick I've landed a ton, so that was annoying. But going into it, I didn't know what place I was. I didn't know what score I got compared to everyone else. I don't look at that. I don't pay attention to that. I uh, I didn't actually know what I got at the end of the day until they told me halfway through the interview, and it was just about improving my personal run. And uh, when I can improve my run, that's when the scores come in, and they're good, hopefully. That's really interesting. So you don't actually pay attention in the middle of the event to what the scoreboard is saying. It's, it's all by feel, really. Yeah, I mean, my coach, so I, my coach won't tell me anything. I ask him not to tell me the scores or the numbers or where I am in the list. 
he will just tell me what, like, hey, man, you should probably do this trick, adjust your run this way. And uh, I don't need to know that stuff. It's just all distractions. I don't need to know what the numbers are. Well, for, forgive me, what stage of your career are you at here? Like, are you a veteran in this event? Is this something that you're just getting started out on this journey? Because some of these um, events in the Winter Olympics, it seems like you can start at 16 and peak at 18, and some of them we see 30, 32-year-olds winning. So I know you're still obviously a very young man, but how do you feel, or what part of that journey are you on at the moment? Um, I definitely, I'm no veteran, that's for sure. In half pipe skiing, I think the oldest guy is 30, and uh, the best dudes are around 25, I'd say, or there's some young kids that are really good as well. But for me, it's just uh, I want to keep doing it as long as I'm having a good time. And so clearly, I'm having a good time right yeah, now, yeah, so I'll keep like doing it. it. <laughs> <laughs> What's the circuit like? How often can you actually do this competitively? Like, um, right, so you know, what was your last six months have been like building up to Pyeongchang? Um, this year was a stressful one, honestly. I had more competitions in a shorter time period than any year ever. We had four. There was one World Cup in. New Zealand in August or September and then after that there's four events within like a month or two just pretty much I was gone more than I was at home and so it was a stressful one I didn't know I was qualified until like a week before the Olympics and so that was scary would you be able to fix that in four years time um, what was that? Sorry. Will you be able to fix that in four years' time? Do you think and actually qualify early so you can build to peak at the Olympics as opposed to building to peak to try and qualify? Well, I mean, I hope so. I mean, in my sport's different. You can't qualify like a year in advance. It's just how the point system works. And so I would like to be in an easier position next year to not have to stress so much, but or not next year, next Olympic cycle to not have to stress so much, but... uh I, uh, again, I don't look at the numbers. I must ask you about the dangers of your sport, Boba, because you're getting to 30 feet in the air at some stage, and certainly last week when there was high winds in Pyeongchang, there was a lot of people falling as a result directly of the wind, so thankfully I don't think your fall was too bad yesterday, but I presume you've had falls much more severe than the one you had yesterday. Yeah, I've had some pretty gnarly crashes, not too hyped on that aspect, I mean... But it's definitely like a, a mental game. It's a huge mental game. And I started working out or working with a sports psychologist this year. His name's Dan. Dan's the man. Let's give him a quick shout out. But uh, it you got to be able to get past that stuff in your brain. If you're thinking crashes, you're going to crash. And so you have to think, all right, I'm going to land this. I'm going to be fired up about it. And like, you just got to look past the crashes about a month ago or probably a little more now I landed flat on my butt pretty much just so bad and I've got a little probably a minor concussion I don't really know but it was a definitely an injury that I wasn't happy on I had a swollen cheek for sure and um, just have to look past it pretend it never happened that's not easy to do no it's definitely not but like what I've been working on is I have these phrases that I say in my brain that bring me back to where my head would be at at the best situation. So I'll say that and it instantly distracts myself because you can't think of two things at once. And so if you're thinking crashes, you need to get that out of your mind. And so I'll say something else to get me back into where I need to be mentally. But, but does qualifying for the Olympics like this, does it help in terms of um, raising your profile and just generally from a financial sense? Because I, I get the impression that a lot of you guys don't actually, you know, it's, it's not an easy way to make a living. That you, There's risk involved, obviously. It's expensive to travel around the world and the, the prize money isn't going to see you retiring to the Bahamas at 25. You're right about that. Um, it's definitely like, skiing's interesting. All the money goes to the people that run it pretty much and then the top dudes the best dudes make enough and they do pretty well but then everybody else makes next to nothing i personally i have got two jobs i work at a ski shop and i'm also a ski coach and uh 
that's how I fund what I do. So I'm working, I'll train all day and then I'll go straight to my job and then I'll go straight to my next job and then I'll go home and sleep and then I'll come back and do it again. That's incredible dedication that I'm not sure everybody fully understands either. And I think that's kind of one of the main reasons why stories like yours actually, they, they cross over and people fully realize the level of sacrifice that you've got to make to go out there and do this. Yeah, but I wouldn't do it if I didn't love it, you know? No one's making me ski pipe. I just, I love what I do. And so it's all worth it. This Olympics especially has made me realize that I, every sacrifice has been worth it. Every crash, every uh, day that I didn't go get a go out with my friends at night because I had to leave the next morning or something, it's all worth it. Bubba, when's your next event? When, when can everybody tune in and, uh, and wish you well? What's happening next? Um, I don't really know. I think there's a World Cup in France but in March, but uh, I don't know if I'm doing it actually. I think I'm going to take that one off and give me a nice break. And I, what I really want to do is just go ski deep snow with my friends. I can't wait for that. Enjoy that, man. Thanks a million for talking to us. Oh, I will. Hey, thank you guys. I appreciate it. Cheers. Take care. It's uh, another story of um, the Winter Olympics from our perspective. Yeah, sorry. Um, uh, unbelievable character. <laughs> jealous of the lifestyle. Yes, yeah. uh, unbelievably jealous. 